We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the truth about blockchain and crypto and the technology itself, because there's been uh, a lot of folks out there who are talking about how it's unhackable and and the ledger is immutable and all that kind of stuff. And and I really we need to dispel some misconceptions. So, uh, Mark, hello, hello, Mark from my, my own backyard here up in Vermont. Great to see you. Um, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, blockchain and crypto technology today, and we're going to start by covering just a basic core understanding of how the technology works. Um, and and we're don't worry, we're not going to get way too techy on this. We're it's going to be just really straightforward, um, easy to understand kind of stuff in terms of how the technology works. And then we're going to get into well, you know maybe we need to talk a little bit about what that really means um, for the future of the technology itself, how it's working its way into real estate and all of those sorts of components. So we're going to we're gonna talk about all of this today. Now, before we get into this, um, thank you to everybody who is saying hello already. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, my name is Alex Camilio. I am the CEO of the Agent Inner Circle uh, with agentinnercircle.com. I am from the beautiful Burlington, Vermont. Uh, it is a little chilly up here these days, but, uh, you know, beautiful nonetheless. And uh, hey, Christine, great to see you. Happy New Year to you as well. Um, so as you heard, my name is Alex Camilio. CEO of the Agent Inner Circle. Uh, I've done a bunch of stuff over the years um, within technology. Uh, in technology, gosh, I taught myself to code when I was 10. Uh, so now we're 27 years into working in technology to some extent or another, uh, working on servers, on computers, on coding, on all of that sort of stuff. So I have a really good basis of understanding to be able to share these topics with you. Now, in that time, I've also done a lot of work to help a lot of real estate agents with all sorts of stuff from technology to marketing uh, to personal follow-up, all of those sorts of things. I'm always happy to help. I do a lot of speaking uh, all over the industry. So if you would like me to come out and speak on a bunch of different topics, uh, feel free to reach out. All right. So what is the blockchain? That's that's where we're going to start this is, is get a very core understanding of what is the blockchain and how does it work? Just the, the basics, basics of how this technology works so that we can work from that understanding going forward. So the whole concept is of blockchain is that it wants to improve the security of servers and of the information that we are storing um, out on the internet and how we're transitioning data, how we're moving data back and forth between servers, between um, things online, and how we're accessing them. Okay, so that's the start. Now, the goal of it is to do this in a totally secure manner where it can't be hacked, it can't be changed, it can't be. And that's where a lot of those sort of misconceptions come about because everybody went out and said, oh, we're, we're doing this thing and we're going to make it unhackable. And then everybody started going, well, it's unhackable. And then it's like, well, mm, is it? So that's what we're really going to kind of cover today is the concepts of that. So the basics of blockchain are essentially this. And, and I'm kind of, you know, distilling things a little bit here for us, but we'll give you the, the core basics to it, okay? So the basics are that we have our computer in front of us and we need to somehow get information to a server or request information from a server that's out there on the internet. Maybe it's a website, uh, maybe it's the CRM that you're using, maybe it's a, a, a digital signature that you're doing, any of those sorts of things, you need to pass data back and forth. So to do that, what you're going to do is your computer is going to send out a set of information and it's going to essentially, you can see here, it's trying to link up to a bunch of servers. Now, instead of sending it to one location, it actually sends it to multiple at the same time. And this is where the first component of security for this comes in. So the first thing is it sends out this information and then all of the servers on the other side take a second and they say, hey, we're going to check with each other to make sure that that information that you sent is, is verified, that it was correct and it was sent to the same way with the same piece of data to all of these different servers. So that if someone were to, say, try to hack in, right, and they were getting, um, they got into one of these 
right? And they, they somehow messed with the data for one of these. The other two of these would be correct. And then when they verified against each other, then they go, oh no, that one is wrong. So these two other ones must be right. And we're going to overwrite the data on that third one to be what these other two confirm that it's going to be. And most of these require at least 50% of the servers that are in the network to say, yep, that data is correct. We all confirmed it. And if more than 50% of them have it confirmed, then they say, okay, good to go. And they pass that data forward. Okay. So they talk with each other and then they pass the data back to your computer, having been confirmed, right, and, and secured and so on. Now, the data that is then stored on those servers um, is encrypted, and it, there are a bunch of different standards for how it can be encrypted, but it is stored in an encrypted manner, and they, when they check against each other, they're not actually sending out full sets of data, they're checking the encryptions against one another, okay? Heather, hello, hello, good to see you, welcome in. So the basics of this are that the data is encrypted and it's verifying that data, how it's sending back and forth. That's all we really need to know when we're talking about the basics of it. Oh, and one more thing. Whenever it changes data or updates data in some way, it makes a record that says, hey, we changed the data from A to B. Here's the record of which, okay? That's essentially how blockchain works. You know, for I, I hope I made it as simple as possible. And if anyone has questions as we go today, feel free to put them in chat. I know some of this can be a little bit confusing. Um, but really, when it comes to blockchain, you don't need to know more than that about the tech. It's encrypted. It's verified back and forth so that we know it's in encrypted and we know that the data is correct when it gets sent or passed back, that it's not one of the servers wasn't messed with. Um, and those are the basics, okay? Now, now that we understand this core and the basics of how the blockchain essentially works, is we're going to dive into, let's examine the safety of the blockchain. Because the whole premise of this, the whole notion of this is that we are going to make the information we're passing more and more secure, and we are going to set ourselves up to be able to transition and change a number of the things um, in our industry because of which. So what we're going to examine today is we're going to examine the core concepts of how this technology works and the, the security around it. So the first piece of this is the human element. Then we're going to go into the security of the servers and the data themselves. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the processes that crypto and, and blockchain could replace. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the cost and what the cost to replace thing, these things are. And we'll talk about the future. And, and I want to have a conversation with everybody about, hey, do we think this really is the future and what we're going to be doing, um, you know, in the next three to five years, okay? So the first piece of this is the human element, the human element. And this is a really, really critical piece that we need to talk about. And the reason being is that a lot of folks out there, when they start talking about blockchain and crypto, are thinking that, okay, this is going to, you know, drastically improve the security of the data that we're sending around the industry, okay? And the sad part is, it's not. Um, and we'll we'll get into this in a few different facets. But the first one is the human element of this. Because for as safe as we can make our servers, how we pass data, all of those sorts of things, if the human element of this is not safer than they were previously, it doesn't really matter. And there's some really interesting data and some pieces of info that have come out over the last couple of years um, that kind of give us an idea of what this really means. So the first piece of data is that over a billion dollars was lost last year in crypto and blockchain fraud. Over a billion dollars. Wait a minute. I thought I thought this was unhackable. I, I thought I'm I'm confused, guys. Like, I don't know. How could we get a billion dollars hacked when right? 
but it, but everybody says it's unhackable. Here's the thing of this, okay? 82% of data breaches last year were caused by human error. Human error. Whether that be a bad password, a repeated password, a virus that you let onto your computer, a link that you clicked in the wrong email, uh, the wrong number that you punched in to send your, your money somewhere that someone scammed you into. Those are all reasons, and the, and the list goes on and on and on. But the number one reason remains bad passwords. It's 82%. 80 2% of the issue that we're dealing with has nothing to do with the servers and the data, okay? So at best, at, at absolute best, if blockchain and crypto work the way that they are theorized to work, in a best case scenario, we are only, only improving 18% of the problem less than 20% of the problem is now improved because of this technology. So, so we need to keep that in mind right off the jump, that we're not fixing the data security for all of data security. We're fixing one minor component of security, and that's in theory if this thing works the way that we think it should. Now, let's go a step forward here, because what I'm showing on the left-hand side of the screen is uh, something called Hashcat. And this is, you can go Google this on the open web. Um, we can pull this up. It's easy to do. Anybody here can go download this. Uh, this is a password recovery tool. And essentially what this does is it takes a bunch of different, uh, when you secure your password, it is either encrypted or what is called hashed. And when you do that, you're basically, you know, putting it into a certain encryption protocol. Well, um, a bunch of hackers have been able to work backwards and come up with all of these encryption protocols. Now, do any of these look uh, pretty common to anybody here? Bitcoin? That's a, that's a pretty common item on the blockchain, right? Blockchain My Wallet? Stellar Lumen? Stellar Wallet? Ethereum? Multi-bit, all of these wallets are essentially um, people's passwords, right? And and this is a way where if you do not have a secure password, if um, so you uh, you know leak or your password gets leaked somehow, they can actually work backwards to unencrypt it, to decrypt that data, and make it so that they can then use your passwords. So once again, when we start looking at the human element of this, we start realizing that, wait a sec. Okay, so the data transfer might be a little bit better, but, you know, 82% of our problem is still there, is still in front of us, and still something that we've got to focus on. So this technology is not going to be, you know, the, the end-all, be-all of data security like a lot of folks are out there um, talking about it being, okay? Any questions on the human element component of this before we dive forward? And I think it's pretty clear to see that, you know, if your computer gets hacked and you start entering wrong data, well, how, do, how does the computer know, right? It, it really doesn't. So any questions? Is this pretty amazing to everybody? Let me, let me know in chat if this is pretty amazing to you that, um, you know, this is the state of things right now. Uh, in the world of blockchain compared to what everybody has heard about. I'll give it a few seconds here for folks to respond in chat. Also, if you want to drop a like or a follow, uh, I believe the notifications are all set up. We should see some great notifications and stuff like that on stream for folks that are uh, dropping likes and follows and all that kind of stuff below. So I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. So now that we have an understanding of the human element of this um, and the fact that the, the human aspect of this is not really safer than the rest of it, um, <laughs> Heather says, anything blows my mind with this stuff. <laughs> That's fair. So now that we have an understanding of the human element of this and the fact that the human element of this can still be hacked very easily, very readily, and that's what happens the majority of time, let's go on and look at that 18%, okay? Because um, 
you know, if we are making a great advancement in that 18%, then okay, maybe it might be worth it. We'll do some cost analysis and we'll see, but let's go from there. Okay. So let's get into the servers and the data. Now, this is the next step where people are saying the blockchain is unhackable and they might tell you, well, oh yeah, a human can get hacked, but the, the technology itself is still fine, is still great. And you know, that's not gonna get hacked and we can still do smart contracts and we can still do all of these sorts of things. The, the problem is the folks who are telling you that haven't done a Google search, apparently. Um, and I'm flat out calling folks out. I, I'm not going to name names here, but there are a lot of people running around the industry right now talking about blockchain being unhackable, talking about things that, um, quite frankly, are debunked with a basic Google search for any of us that know the technology in this space. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying call people out individually, but w that's why we're here today is to clear up some of these misconceptions, okay? So let's talk a little bit about how do you hack the blockchain itself? Well, there's this little thing called a 51% attack. And this essentially tricks the network into thinking there are more servers, okay? Now let, let's go step forward. So when we saw before, we saw the basics of your computer is sending um, data out to uh, a server, out to, you know, the blockchain, and it's saving it and encrypting it and so on. But if you know a little bit how the, how the internet works, um, and you step forward from that, you start to realize that um, there is, uh, there's another layer in between the servers over here, the blockchain that's encrypting all your data, okay, and the computer itself. And these are your networking. These are little devices. Basically, it's like the router in your own home. But essentially, these are little devices that are either called routers or load balancers or things like that, which tell this how to pass the data Okay, it says, oh yeah, that server's located here and that server's located here and this one's located over here. And it also tells all of these servers how many servers are in their network. Because remember, in a blockchain, it needs at least 51% of those servers to say, yep, that data is verified before it passes that data forward. And, and I'll, I'll explain why, okay? Not only is it a security measure, but let's say we need to bring a new server online. Let's say we have one of our servers crash and we need to bring a brand new server online and bring all of that data over onto it. Well, what it's gonna do is it's gonna go out and it's gonna say, hey, let's look how many servers are there. Okay, there's 100 servers. The 51 of them say that this data is correct. And if 51 of them say it's correct, it copies all of that information over to the other. Well, in a 51% attack, what happens is a bad actor, a set of servers comes in and essentially they don't go after the servers, the blockchain itself and all of this, they go after the network. And essentially what they do is they come in and they get the network to be tricked into thinking that there are more than 100 servers. All of a sudden there are 200 servers, there are 1,000 servers. And because there are 1,000 servers and you control 900 of them, well, guess what's gonna happen? Any guesses? <laughs> Let me know in chat, any guesses what happens when this server comes in and says, you know what, now I'm 900 of those servers. I control 900 of them and you only control 100. What happens to these other servers over here? Well, if you said that these servers over here verify and copy the bad data, over to what they're doing in the, the new ones. Yeah, these all get ignored. And not only do they get ignored, they actually copy the data backwards. 
the server, the, this infrastructure actually says, oh my gosh, these hundred servers, they must all be wrong. They must have all gotten hacked. We need to make sure that they all have the correct data. Let's copy all of that correct data off of the main server over here. And now all of a sudden, you're verifying data that is bad data. The blockchain has been messed with, has been changed. And if all of these servers are treated as though they are brand new, fresh out of the box servers and get totally wiped over, you don't even necessarily have a record. Like, remember we were talking about how they store historical records of each change one by one by one? You don't even necessarily have that because those servers have now been written over. So we start to notice that this is essentially what's called a 51% attack. And, and there have been some improvements um, and things of that nature to try to combat some of this stuff. However, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, it's a little harder to do this than it is to hack a normal server, but it is still hackable. It is still able to be compromised. The data itself, the core of the blockchain itself has the ability to be compromised. And that's really all we need to know at this point. And I can go through, you know, the, the back and forth battle. But it's the same sort of thing that we run into all the time, which is if someone relies on something as being unhackable and then it's not, well, then all of the premises and processes that we've set up because that thing is quote unquote unhackable now need to get changed. Okay. And again, feel free to look up 51% attacks, how they work, um, how they've, you know, been carried out. And don't get me wrong, it is harder to do this kind of attack uh, than it is to hack into some other types of servers. But we get, we get, like I said before, we get back to that place now where all of a sudden we're going, oh, yeah, that is hackable. The data can be changed. The, the data can be updated. It might be harder to do, but it's not impossible. And I think that's a really big, big point that we need to pay attention to here. Now, let's talk a little bit about the processes because we've, we've looked at, okay, the human element of this is still hackable. The server aspect of this is still hackable. Let's go forward and think about what processes people are trying to have these replace, okay? Um, because I'm hearing a lot out there about it's going to replace decentralized banking. Um, where the people are talking about smart contracts and the you know direct payments for properties getting processed through these. We're talking about title records and title searches um, being processed, and and then just general data storage, right? Storing property management data, storing all of those sorts of things that we might need. Now, when we think about this for a minute, um, and and. I should have said this at the beginning, so I apologize, but I don't want to get into the nature of um, the value of a cryptocurrency. And the reason I say that is the currency aspect, it's really no different than speculating on any foreign currency, um, except it's not regulated the same way foreign currencies are, and there's no insurance like your common banking uh, on most of the platforms you're in. So there's no FDIC to protect you. There's also no none of those things. But people have made plenty of money speculating on crypto, just like they've made plenty of money speculating on foreign currencies. Um, I don't really see those as being vastly different. So if that's something you want to do and you think you can, you know, play the market and have some fun, okay. But with how much money has been lost in the last year and the fact that there that it is not insured in any way, shape, or form, I really consider that a buyer beware kind of situation um, simply because it's, you know, it's a, it's a gamble, right? You're gambling. But let's get into what everybody's talking about when it comes to real estate and the concepts of things like direct payments for properties, smart contracts, title records and searches, uh, general data storage, things of that nature. And I've actually been seeing this next screenshot um, pop up all over the place because it, it kind of gives a good uh, understanding of where the situation is now, but where they're hoping for it to go and why that's just not feasible. So right now um, we have, you know, buyer, seller, and we have a bunch of people in the middle um, transferring the title, lawyers, brokers, uh, insurance, title insurance, title search, um, you know, the, the 
state and different people who are regulating this and keeping the records for the titles and all of those sorts of things that go on. Now, those people are all needed because the process is not perfect. Meaning, uh, and we've seen, I mean, let me ask, how many folks have had an issue with a title in one of their, one of the properties they've either, you know, helped buy or sell over the years? Let me, let me ask, right? There's been a lien on it. There's been an issue. Has, have folks run into this? Let me, let me know in chat if you've, uh, if you've run into this before. The reason things like title search are in there is because you don't necessarily know that the records are all consolidated, right? That's number one. And then two, you don't know the validity of the records. You don't know whether this lien is correct or not, whether there's fraud that happened in that, right? Mark says 75K tax lien, right? Things of that nature. And what they're talking about here is that, oh, well, we can get rid of things like, say, a title search because all of that data is stored in one place and it can't be changed and it can't be edited and it can't be modified and they're all that, right? And that's the theory behind it. But that's broken, isn't it? We just saw how humans can have an issue there. We saw how um, the technology itself can have an issue there. So then who is it that's going to confirm the data? So somebody needs to go through and actually confirm the data because we know it can be messed with. And if someone has to go through and confirm all the data in a smart contract, what does that sound like to everybody? Does that sound like a title search? I mean, I, am I losing my mind here? Or like the, the whole notion of a smart contract, right? Is that it all is, is can't be changed and can't be hacked and it's fine. So we, we can get rid of some of these other processes. Doesn't sound so smart, does it? So, so I'm sitting here and I'm like, wait a minute. So the whole process, the whole concept is to get rid of title searches, to get rid of some of these people, but then we just see a flaw that makes it absolutely impossible to get rid of those people. What? Like, like this is one of those, like, again, the, the technology is very cool. It's an interesting concept. It's wonderful in a lot of those regards. But when we really start putting this into practice, we start going, oh, yeah, huh. Now, let me go, go a step further with this, okay? Because let's say we are going to replace something like a title search. Well, that would require that all of the historical data surrounding the title gets input into this new system. That's also assuming that all of that data gets input correctly. So what happens if... Yeah, so Heather says, I 100% know I can go in and change things, never have, and I'm not that tech savvy. Exactly. So then we go a step further in this and we say, okay, well, a human can go in and change the data entry when they're actually entering titles into the system to begin with. Well, let's say they make an error. How do they modify it? Well, they modify it in a certain way and there has to be a part of the system that can modify it. Now we're right back to step one where the human aspect of this can get hacked and modify the same data. But now if the data gets put in in this modified format and we start looking at the data as having been, quote unquote, unhackable, well, then that's going to be miserable for anybody. Let's say somebody accidentally put a, a 75K tax lien on your property because they typed the address one, one character wrong. And now you're, you're going, well, I don't have a 75K lien on my property. What do you mean? I never took that out. How is that? but the data is unhackable. See the problems we're running into here? Like there are some major, major problems with the core concepts around this technology that it doesn't necessarily step us that far forward um, when it comes to what we're doing. Now, the next one is the cost, okay? So we've covered that it's not unhackable, that it can be hacked, 
We've covered that the human element is still the weakest point of this technology. We've covered that in its core theory, it can't really replace a lot of the systems and things that we have in place currently because it is flawed and it has those problems. So it will only cause more problems to get rid of those things that we currently have, right? So now let's get into cost. Is this going to cost us the same amount of money to run these systems as it would uh, to run a normal data center, a normal server to save this data, and maybe even do data backups and register new data when it comes in and all that kind of stuff? Well, let's look. So how much does it cost to run something on the blockchain? So traditional servers you can run at about $2.76 per gigabyte per year, roughly, depending on who you're using for data storage, who you're, all that kind of stuff, okay? Or up to $100 per gigabyte per year with blockchain. Now, there are a lot of different uh, concepts, a lot of different information about there out there about how much more it costs. Um, but rule of thumb is we're seeing anywhere from 10x to 36x. This would be 36 times the cost to run the same servers, the same bit of information, right? All of that. 36 times the cost. Are we 36 times more secure than we were before? Are we removing 36x the cost from all of the other things that we're doing and replacing components of, of the industry? No, not really. And, and it's hard to give exact detailed numbers on all of this, so I'm giving you some rough ideas. So let me ask everybody in chat, is all the extra cost worth it? Like, I'd love to know what everybody thinks here. Now that we've really broken this down and thought through how this whole process works, is it, is this worth it? Is this worth paying 36 times more for storage so that we can be like, less than a percent more secure, less than 2% more secure? Probably not. Right? Probably not. And this is why, this is why I did this today. And we're going to talk, we're, we're not done yet. We're going to talk a little bit about the future of the technology itself and where things are going. Um, but this is where this is why I've been so frustrated seeing these presentations and podcasts and all sorts of stuff recently because folks are out there just touting it, going like it's unhackable and you know it, it, no matter what it'll replace this and it'll replace that and it'll replace this and everybody needs to work on the blockchain and share data that way and so on. And I'm like, do we? Do we really? Like, it, it's not. It's not really more beneficial for us right now. Now. If the cost were in line with what we're currently doing, that would be a different story. Like we talked about before, it is slightly more secure, right? We, we talked about that. It, it is slightly more secure. It is harder to hack these multiple servers than it is to hack just one server out there, okay? But when we're talking about that much more cost for that little improvement, that's where we really start need to, needing to look at this and saying, yeah, it's not worth the cost right now. Now, one of the reasons it is so much more expensive is because the data, to be able to encrypt it on all of these different servers along the way, um, require pretty heavy and advanced graphics processing unit, graphics cards. Um, now, a, a good graphics card that's going to be able to do this goes for anywhere from 600 up to, I mean, good, good, good and expensive ones are anywhere from 600 bucks to two grand, 2,500. I've even seen them go as high as five grand a piece. That is 
per server. And a lot of times people are stacking one after another after another um, of these graphics units to be able to process all of the math to be able to do the encryptions that need to be done. Now, graphics cards and graphics processing units are still improving, okay? We, um, but the rate at which they are improving has slowed down pretty significantly. Um, between two generations ago and the last generation of tech, uh, it, well, three generations ago to two is about 100% improvement in processing. Um, two generations ago to the last generation was about 50%. Last generation to the newest generation is about a 30-35% uh, increase in processing. So we can see that the uh, speed at which we're improving graphics cards is slowing down over time. So if we were continuing to grow graphics cards and their ability to process at 100% you know, leaps, well then we're talking 10, 15, 20 years before this technology is viable at the kind of cost that we're talking about, right? right? The, in terms of comparing to what we're already doing. Um, if it doesn't, if it continues to slow down, uh, we may not see that technology be feasible in terms of cost benefit um, for a bit longer. And it really, really depends on how the hardware advances over time. Um, and anytime you're kind of tying your technology to whether the hardware advances um, fast enough, uh, it's another really pretty huge gamble because, you know, you never know on both sides. Next year, they, next thing we know, there might be an amazing advancement in graphics cards that I don't know about. Um, and all of a sudden, they're a thousand times more powerful than they were. And the whole world is, I mean, the world would be different. That was the, like, I can't tell you how many things in the world would change if that were to happen, okay? So that's sort of the future of the technology, is this technology is really, really bound to how fast graphics processing units, graphics cards in people's computers, um, how fast those advance. And without really significant advancement in that hardware, I don't see a significant advancement in this technology in the very, very near future. Um, but, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, once the hardware catches up, this might be the way we end up going simply in that it is a small percentage more secure. But in the current day and age, I don't see it as being um, worthy. I don't see it as being worth the cost. Uh, for what we're doing, because it surely doesn't make us that much more secure um, from where we were previously. All right. All right. Questions. What do folks have for questions? Did this help? Did this give a, a good sort of overview and concept of where we are with this technology today and, and how this is working? I would love to know in chat if, uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Mark. So I just, I really hope to give everybody the, the information that they need on this because, like I said, there's a lot of information going around out there about the validity of this, about... Um, <laughs> Heather says, I will always be lost. That's funny. But I, I think you got it, Heather. I mean, you, you saw very quickly that in a big picture sense, if the thing that's unhackable can be hacked and it costs us a ton more money to do. Mm. Heather says, however, it was helpful to reaffirm my fears with it. I don't know if fear might be the right word, but uh, trepidation, maybe. I just, I'm hesitant about diving in and saying, yes, we need to replace. Um, yeah, absolutely. Christine says, yes, it was helpful. Who knows how technology will change again over the next 10 to 20 years? You are absolutely right. Um, one thing I, I would keep in mind, though, you know, Christine, and this is something that a lot of my tech friends and I talk about, is people think that... Um, human advancement 
with technology is just sort of a linear curve or is a, a curve that's always on the upswing. Um, but weirdly throughout history, that, that actually hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, there have been periods in history where we, we've actually lost certain technology to time, um, where we've, you know, uh, technology advancements have uh, slowed down incredibly fast and gone to a snail's pace because, you know, things happen where, like, we find a, a new metal, and we go, oh, my gosh, that new metal can do X, Y, and Z. And then we, we get to the limits of that, and then we find something new. So it could go either way. And that's, a that's always a tough one to figure out. Um, the current state of technology, though, seems to be uh, falling off. Yeah, no, Heather, you're absolutely right. QR codes, we were almost lost to time. I actually... I was thinking about that when I said earlier that the technology wasn't there. The hardware wasn't there at the beginning of QR codes. And think about that. That was 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I was saying it. I was the one out there making that mistake, being like, hey, it's going to happen. Hey, it's going to happen. And for me, I always think about it now in terms of um, the right answer at the wrong time is still wrong. And I think about that in terms of even myself and some of the QR code stuff. I knew it was coming. I just didn't know how long. I wasn't smart enough to really think about the hardware and some of the, the limitations of it and things like that. I thought that smartphones were going to advance quicker to how they were advancing in Japan, in Korea, in other countries. And I did not think that the U.S. would be five, six, seven years behind um, say Japan and their phones flat out, right? I knew it was coming sim similar to this. I think we're in a very similar state. We are at a point in time where the hardware is not quite there yet. And this technology eventually may be there. Um, but until that happens, it's not that much better and it's way more costly. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to leave it open just for a minute here for any other questions, um, if folks have them. Um, I hope this was helpful for everybody today. If it was, I would greatly appreciate the, uh, the like um, and a follow if you haven't already followed the page. We would greatly, greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, any questions before we close this up today? I hope this was helpful for everybody. Uh, give folks a little bit of a better understanding of the the technology and and you know where we're heading. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. Well, I appreciate everybody for taking the time out of their day to come show up to this. Um, awesome. Well, thank you, Christine. Awesome. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out today. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Feel free uh, to leave a comment. Uh, and that being said, if you are watching the replay, um, definitely give a like down below and make sure that, uh, you know, you give us the follow if you are around. Um, and if you are watching the replay, definitely leave a comment down below as well and let us know uh, what you think, if you learned something today, uh, and what you're going to do differently now that you know this information. So, awesome. All right, well, I'm going to close it down. Thank you again for everybody for uh, taking time out of your day. I greatly appreciate it, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. All right, thanks, everybody.